So please help me give a warm welcome to Mary Hartley. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm here to answer the question of um, how do you maintain, okay? Um, I'm going to start by reading something from my website, a little blog I wrote. And this is called My Aha Moment. Um, on LinkedIn, I am a member of a group for um, practitioners who use this non-diet method for weight control or intuitive eating. And we were asked to write about our aha moment when we switched over from conventional dieting to this other method. I'll just read you what I wrote. In 1985, I worked in a large gastroenterology practice affiliated with a teaching hospital. One gastroenterologist performed a procedure with a device called the Garens Edwards Gastric Bubble. The bubble was developed by a team at John Hopkins. It was all above the board, and the hospital asked us to do it. A deflated bubble made of stretchable plastic, much like a pool toy, was placed by endoscopy in the stomach of severely overweight patients. With a pull of a cannula, the bubble was inflated and left in place to fill the stomach while the patient followed a low calorie diet. And that's where I came in. We stopped doing the gastric bubble after a patient got a small bowel obstruction. Those were interesting days, but that was not my aha moment. My aha moment came by way of a patient referred by an internist for a simple weight loss diet. She was a favorite patient, a young woman of my age, overweight but far from obese, with my mother's maiden name. We were doing the balanced, flexible diet thing with a focus on behaviors, when one day she looked at me and she said, Mary, you don't understand. I peek behind the curtain and when my husband drives away, I make a batch of scalloped potatoes and then I eat the whole thing. Aha, I thought, they did not teach us this in school. And then I thought, this is really real. That was my aha moment. Luckily for me, in that practice, we were working with a, am, am I gonna be able to change this? I'm like, am I in the right thing? What's going on here? Oh, there I am, okay, that's still me doing aha. My aha moment was that I learned at that point that dieting, traditional restrictive diets, as we know them, actually make the problem worse. This is not what you're going to wanna to hear, and there are people who are truly overweight and have to figure out how to make the weight come off. But if they continue on their path of rigid dieting, they probably are not going to maintain. So this is the outline. I'm talking about why traditional diets don't work in the long run, and I'm gonna give you like a little bit of nutrition information, like a little course to explain to you what exactly is happening the psychological changes that are associated with dieting, this is all research-based. I want to know, I want you to ask yourself if you've been on too many diets, and then I'm going to teach you how to get off of the diet roller coaster. It is way more um, to it than this talk affords, but at least this will introduce you. And maybe, maybe some of you already do this and know about it, and which would great. There's going to be um, a 15-minute question and answer section at the end, and so I want you to tell me your, your war stories and um, teach each other. Okay, so here's the deal with dieting and binging. It's really difficult to tell which is the chicken and which is the egg, okay? For the most part, the way that people fail to maintain or stop diets in mid-course is because they start to binge eat. I'm not necessarily gonna say that they meet the diagnostic criteria for binge eating disorder in terms of the amount of food or the frequency of eating or all that sort of stuff, but I'm talking about garden variety, um, overeating, feeling guilty, and throwing in the towel, okay? For many people, it was the egg that caused it. 
um, overeating was something they learned in childhood because for children, they do not have as many ways to numb themselves as adults have. They don't have access to alcohol. They don't have access to money to go shopping. They can't have, you know, sex with people. They can't gamble. They, get, they can only eat. And so for lots of people, binge eating predated any dieting. But for many people, it was the actual diets that caused the binging. And that's why the statistics about dieting are so bad. And what it makes me want to explore with you is why would we continue to do something that doesn't work over and over again? I mean, dieting is like a failed experiment that has been going on for 50 years, but yet we just don't change the way we do it. Um, basically in the society nowadays long, did anybody here watch that, that Weight of the Nation show that was on HBO this week? It's on the internet and it's really, really good. It talks about the problem as it is nowadays. But the situation is that two thirds of us are either overweight or obese and that's kind of split down the line. I mean, obesity is defined as um, having a body mass index, you know, BMI that's over 30, whereas overweight is in the range of 25 to 30. But, you know, some people can tolerate more weight than others, and so far as some people can carry weight and it won't start all of the constellation of um, chronic health problems, the, the blood sugar problem, the blood pressure, all that stuff, where other people really, just in the overweight range, their bodies can't take it and start to fall apart. So, so two-thirds of us have a problem. 61% of women say that they would like to lose weight. And actually, at any one point of time, about 60% of women will say that they're trying to, trying to lose weight. Uh, with men, it's a little less. Men, they're starting to come around. Not that they, they're in any better shape, that's for sure, because men don't have as much of a problem until they hit age 30, but in between 30 and 50, they gain so much weight that they outpace the women in terms of the rate of weight gain. Um, more than 60% of adults have tried to lose weight, yet at one year out, okay, so take the, say, for anybody who lost weight, go one year out and start counting, 83% of them have get, regained the weight and more. And if you go out five years, like 95% of the people have failed. So why do we keep doing the wrong thing and why do individuals blame themselves instead of the methods? Now granted, we, all, we mostly all can, you know, um, take some of the blame for not being as, as conscientious or responsible as we could be. But these stats, like, are not in the individual's um, favor, you know what I mean? So, like, to me, the only people who are making out by this scene are the diet industry, because they're hoping that you're going to come back for more. So what's very interesting about this is this is I'm going to sell you on the idea that perhaps it's the diet that made you binge. Okay, so you're not the type of person who had an insult in childhood where you, ha you overate as a way to, to cope. You might be someone who, like, was not overweight, you know? You were the type of kid who was active, running around, growing tall, never even had any extra weight, and who knew, as you approached middle age, where did these 40 pounds come from, you know, that sort of thing? And so you show up and you think you're doing the right thing. Maybe even your doctor told you, go to Weight Watchers, do this, do that, do the other. And you did it. And then all of a sudden, or maybe not all of a sudden, but insidiously, your mindset changed. And you became a person who thought differently. Well, we go back to the original research, which was a real eye-opener when it happened. Back in World War II, the, probably one of the greatest nutritionists, an MD from the University of Minnesota, his name is Ansel Keys, many of the key concepts in nutrition are attributed to him. He did an experiment on conscientious objectors to World War II. 
Um, they, they wouldn't, you know, go to the war, but instead they agreed to help him in a research study that was done to figure out how to refeed victims of starvation in the war, okay? Um, what would be some of the psychological and physiologic effects of refeeding starving people? So these young guys, they were like, you know, say 20 year old guys from the Midwest agreed to starve. Now, by starving, Dr. Keyes put them on a 1,600-calorie ca six, diet, which, now these are guys, so this would be the equivalent of, say, maybe a woman following a 1,000-calorie diet. It's not, not something that's, like, crazy, okay? They did it for three months. They lost weight at an average of about 2.5 pounds a month so that they ended up losing 25% of their body weight. While they were losing weight, they became depressed, irritable, impatient, listless and apathetic, kind of cranky like dieters we've known, right? But more than that, while they were losing weight, all thoughts turned to food. Whereas they, as young men, really never thought of food. While they were on this diet, they dreamt of food, they wouldn't stop talking about food, as they were living in the compound where their you know, lifestyle took place while they, were, while they were eating this food. They would clip pictures of food out of magazines, they would trade recipes, they would not stop talking about food. And then when they stopped dieting and entered the refeeding stage, they binged. These people never binged in their life, but they hoarded food. They would, they would take all the food that they could get and try to save some for later, as if it was going to be pulled away from them again. They binged, they ate to the point of the, where they felt uncomfortably stuffed. They couldn't get enough back into them. And this behavior continued for between six and nine months until they finally regained their weight and managed to put in enough time to wash out that experience of starving. If this was a person who went on a weight loss diet, they probably wouldn't last the whole nine months to reflush out their habits, right? They'd be back in another diet. So now they're on this crazy roller coaster of trying to restrict and then naturally falling into the course of the hoarding and the binging and everything else. So what the heck is going on? Well, the researchers, researchers, I'm from New England, so I have a bit of a, my daughter makes fun of me. Um, they define, they use these words to define what is happening, and they call it restraint. When they talk about restrained eaters, they are kind of talking about what we call chronic dieters, yo-yo dieters. But basically, the restraint they're talking about is that the person puts themselves in a box, okay? Tries to restrain, tries to control, tries to control what they're doing in a very tight way. But what they do is they stop using their body signals to regulate their intake, to let themselves know when they're hungry, to let themselves know when they're full, that kind of thing. They, they, they leave their body out of it, and they turn eating into a cognitive process. And you've heard about many speakers I'm hearing the words cognitive changing, that kind of thing. This, these are the changes that need to be made, some of them, not just changes to like your environment, it's triggers, whatever, but changing the crazy diet mindset that, that develops. Um, they need to get away from the restraint, the over-restraint, which just leads to this concept called disinhibition. That means forget your inhibitions, forget, you know, just throw the towel in. And this was best shown by this classic study that was done quite a long time ago called the milkshake study, but it's done over and over again. I just saw it done with cookies like late last year, it was, it was written up in Forbes magazine, but it's always the same concept. And basically it was used to show 
how the mindset of the dieter differs from the mindset of a person who hasn't dieted, which might, we might call like a normal eater, okay? So here's the milkshake study. These researchers got, well, they, they gave a screening test to people to find out if they were normal eaters or restrained eaters, okay? And they put them into two groups. And then they separated those groups into three, okay? So each group would have some normal, some restrained, some normal, some restrained, some normal, some restrained. And the study was that they brought the people in and they told them that they were to participate in a test to taste ice cream. Um, they wanted them to fill out sheets, what did it taste like, blah, blah, blah. And the deal was that they could eat as much ice cream as they wanted. And so with group one, they just said, eat the ice cream. And the normal weight people might have eaten the equivalent of four servings, four ice cream cones, where the control, the restrained eaters ate less. They might have ate, eaten two ice cream cones. The next group was given a milkshake before the test. With that, the normal eaters were already full, so they ate less ice cream where the restrained eaters ate more ice cream. They might have eaten three cones instead of two cones. And then the next group, they made them drink two milkshakes before the ice cream test. Well, the normal eaters were down to like one cone. They didn't even want any more. Whereas the restrained eaters ate like four cones. Okay, so like their fullness did not even figure in because what was going on was the what the hell effect, and that is what the researchers named it. And basically what's happening is that if you can picture the boundaries that a dieter gives himself, okay, versus the boundaries that, say, the normal eater has, the normal eater's boundaries are the entire field, okay? We all have to have some boundaries around us in this obesogenic society where food is hitting us all over the place. I mean, you just could not eat with abandon in this country because it just, we'd kill ourselves. But the normal eaters don't put too many boundaries. You know, they're, they're, they're paying attention, but they're not too narrow. The dieters will not go behind maybe the 30 yard line at the most. If they start to go past that, what happens is, what the hell? Just throw in the towel, I've blown it, forget about it. And that's when the binging comes in. And that happens. It's, that's what the disinhibition is, and that's what tightly wrapped diets cause. And it has been shown over and over again, and you never hear about this because the diet companies don't want you to know about it is basically what's going on. Damn, nuts. Okay, so like basically, is this you? Do you know, do you, how, do you know if you have a mi diet mindset? Um, do you know, are, are you the type of person who says, what the hell when, you know, you think, you think you've overeaten? Oh, what the hell, I might as well eat more, I've blown it now. Or even you anticipate overeating, okay? This is gonna be a situation where there's gonna be a lot of food, so, I already know I'm going to blow it. Um, or you anticipate a new diet. Say, for instance, it's Friday night, and I'm already eating too much food. I'm out to, but it's not Monday. And so we just say, oh, what the hell? I'm, it's, I'm going to start a diet on Monday, so I might as well tank up all weekend long. Okay? Normal people do not do this, okay? Or are you depressed? Oh, you know, ugh, life. Might as well eat. Or if you think you gain weight, you know, I'm trying so hard, I step on the scale, I didn't lose weight, what the hell, it's out of here. Or, mm, you've had a few drinks, a natural disinhibition agent, okay? Mm. <laughs> or you see others overeating. Oh, everybody's overeating, I might as well overeat too. I mean, there's just so many reasons why this diet mindset will really bother you, give you, you know, make you, make you not be able to reach or attain maintenance. 
So these are some of the, the ways if you see if you have a diet mindset. And I have a long other list of questions. And actually, on my website, I wrote a little blog called Do You Intuitive Eater Take the Test? Um, it's at askmaryrd.com. So if you want to see all the questions. But the things that, like people who are not intuitive eaters, you know, um, you know, this is, did anybody, does anybody see on, um, I'm using a lot of swear words, but I'm sure you'll forgive me. Um, anybody see, like, on, on the internet, there was, there's been this whole flurry of um, things on, on uh, videos, like on YouTube, about the shit whatever says, like, do you ever see those? Like, the shit dire to say, this is, well, maybe if you didn't. But they'll, they'll have these things where, like, you know, the shit people from New York say, or the, whatever, the shit Italians say. But, well, anyway, this is the shit that dieters say, okay? Like, it, it, this is how you can tell if you've, you've been on too many diets. Well, one of the things that came up in the panel was, um, one of my main reasons for exercising is to manage my weight, okay? So I am not thinking, I want to take a walk on a sunny day. It makes me feel so good. I'm out here in the park. Even this, the phone isn't going to ring. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ha breathing clean air, whatever. No, no, how many calories am I burning? Or I'm either on a diet or seriously considering uh, going on a diet. So, like, basically, you're not just living life. It's, it's always like you're, you're behind the eight ball, you're guilty, you know, where's the next diet? Um, people, like I say, when they do diet too much, they lose, well, it, it, it fills you full of rules, you know, like, well, should I snack, shouldn't I snack, should I um, eat six meals a day, should I not have carbohydrates, should I have blah, 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 you know, all these, and you're trying to think of all these things, and then like through it, the announcement on TV is like the rules have changed, and then like you're all mixed up, and so, like, then they start, like, losing total touch. So if you look at people um, who don't diet, they're much, much more likely to push the plate away, eat slower, know that they're, they're full enough, where people who are dieting, or di they have that hoarding mentality left over from, I better get it now, because the next diet is going to start on Monday, and you know what that means. I'm going to be starving, so I better get it in. Um, or instead of thinking about how nutritious the food is, they're just thinking about how fattening it might be, okay? So like they're saying things like, oh, peanut butter's bad for me, avocados are bad for me, and like this whole litany of things that are bad just on the basis of calories without thinking, gee, you know, that avocado was full of omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin E and vitamin A and all that. Like, no, 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 it's fattening, you know? Like, so their, their mindset gets all wacky. Um, and then this is a big one. They're afraid to be around certain foods that, like, in other words, they give their personal power away to the food, okay? So they're not, like, changing their mind. They're like, whoa, can't get that close to that pizza. Well, I mean... Do you love it or don't you love it? If you love it, can you find a way to eat a slice or two or even three if you're a bigger person and fill the rest of your plate up with salad? I mean, must the pizza be feared to the point where you can't have any? And then if you fall over the 30-yard line, what the hell, I might as well eat the whole pizza and maybe I should eat another pizza. You know what I mean? So, so that's what, what we're thinking. And there are many, many questions like this. Um, you know, I feel safest if I have a diet plan or menu to guide my eating. I often put off buying clothes or participating in fun activities or going on vacations, hoping I will get thinner first. Um, I, I worry, da-da-da, that there, go to my website and read these questions. They're, they're all very telling and fascinating, and I'm, am I getting this? And very different from what people who, I'm using this word intuitive eater, but I'm just going to call it a non-dieter. So call it somebody who, somebody who's never been on a diet, you know, and just doesn't seem to have an issue with food. They are much more um, likely to, to eat when they're hungry, to, to pick what they want, um, to exercise because it makes them feel good, to to think of their body in terms of their health rather than in just how much they weigh, and other people too, not look at other people and think, oh my God, she's so skinny. Like, 
yeah, but she looks terrible and she's always sick, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's that you, but so what the whole point of this is to try to get back to this mindset because until you undo the dieting mindset, you can't, it's, it's very hard to get off the dieting roller coaster. Now, many people have lost weight and kept it off. Um, even the, despite my first set of slides, which said, I mean, even if 95% of the people regained the weight, 5% of the people didn't. And when you talk to those 5% of the people, most of them are not diet mentality crazed. They have found a way to incorporate the intuitive eating lifestyle into their lives without giving it that name, okay? And I think a lot of them will agree with me. The other thing about, about that is I want to say that when people change their weight, you know how like you see people like, I've lost 100 pounds or whatever. For me, be, just because I've been doing this for so many years, I am not, I, I'm like, you know, God bless them, that's wonderful. But until you've maintained the weight loss for five years, I'm just not impressed because I have seen people, and I'm sure you have too, lose 80, gain 80, lose, you know what I mean? Like, how depressing is that? Apart from like just sort of ravaging your body, because when you lose weight, it's, see, it's really, it's really hard not to break down your muscle tissue because when you create a calorie deficit, you've got to get those calories from somewhere. And so you don't only selectively get them from your stored fat. You do break down some of your muscle, too. And whenever you lose part of your muscle mass, your calorie requirements are going to decrease somewhat because muscle is very metabolically active tissue, burning calories. So after you've lost weight, if you regain weight, unless you've regained part of that weight as a muscle mass, now you weigh more but you require fewer calories for that new weight because less of you is muscle because you broke that down when you were losing the weight. So, so you really get into a dilemma when it, it feels like you're not eating as much and chances are you're not, but you've driven down your calorie requirements. Um, not even to mention as we age, we, our calories go down. So this whole deal with this intuitive eating is this. You're really trying to get people back to a state where they regulate their intake by their body signals. Body signals meaning hunger and I'll call it fullness, although if you were in that panel, we were talking a little bit about um, this new book that was written by um, this professor who lived in France for a year called Why French Children Don't Get Fat, and she was basically talking about mindsets of um, French people versus American people. And she said that, like, in this country, you might ask a person after a meal, are you full? She said in France, they would say, are you still hungry? OK, so no one ever expected to get full. People only expected to get um, satisfied. OK, so if I was looking at a scale of 1 to 10, and 10 being super stuffed, like your gas tank is on full, they might expect to get up to say um, three quarters or say uh, an eight, seven and a half, that kind of thing. So that you're satisfied, but you're not stuffed and you're still comfortable. And so the concept of it is to go on to, to try to go on to what is called a demand feeding pattern where that's what babies do, particularly be breastfed babies, because you can't look at the butt, hmm, he took five ounces. You just have to go by the baby's body signals, right? The baby's gonna cry if it's hungry, it's gonna stop feeding if it's full. And that's what is asked. Now people will say, oh my God, I'm always hungry, blah, blah, blah. Um, maybe because the body is a very complicated thing and, um, we, it reacts to stimulus in the environment so that you can say be not really hungry and then see something stimulating, particularly like something on TV or something that the advertising industry has spent 
literally millions and millions and millions of dollars studying your EKGs to see how your brain lights up or your hormones and your gut or whatever to make you hungry by that commercial, okay? They want you to be hungry. So, so it's, it's, it's not as easy as it seems to wait until you're hungry. The other thing is that people might feel quite afraid of hunger particularly due to starvation diets, because even if they're not thinking of that, that memory is still there, and just the idea that, oh my goodness, this might be my last food, we are still hoarding, you know, um, um, they eating for the hunger to come, okay? Um, and then the other part is that you, you want to try to stop when you're satisfied. Well, even that is, a, is an issue, because the human body is programmed to eat yummy food. And so who wants to stop? That in itself, you could work for a whole year just on the concept of stopping when I'm satisfied, as well as even um, the other feelings that promotes. Does that promote fear in you? I mean, suppose I never get satisfied and then there's always that fear. Will I always be fat? How can this work? You know, this kind of thing. The best thing to do when coming up to this approach is to really buy into the idea that diets were the problem and they're never going to solve it and they're never going to work, so what do I have to lose but to try this method? Am I doing the right thing? So my, we, how many times have I heard this word mindfulness today? It is so important. Um, how on earth could you feel a subtle signal of satisfaction when you eat if you're not paying attention? How can you remember you ate if you were doing five different things and shoving food in? Did I eat lunch? I should eat it again. Did I even eat? You know what I mean? Like, no. I mean, the way to really do this and to get yourself out of that is to say, make one rule for yourself, and that means I'm going to sit down to eat, no matter where I am. When I'm eating, I'm going to sit down, and I'm not going to have distractions. And even if that makes me feel uncomfortable, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to put out a placemat. I'm going to put out some silverware. I'm going to use a plate. I'm going to sit there slowly. I'm going to have a pleasant conversation with somebody, or maybe not, and I'm going to pay attention, and I'm going to eat slowly enough so that I can say, how am I feeling? Mm, and that goes either way. I'm not saying, how am I feeling, stop eating. I'm saying, how am I feeling, honor your body. Maybe that wasn't enough food on the plate. Maybe you're not satisfied. Maybe you need a little more. Maybe this is all trial and error, which it is, because your hunger level is going to change based on the time of the month, what you've been doing in terms of activity for the, the other part of your day, what is the content of the meal? Is it sort of filling um, high fat, high protein food versus very airy, watery food? Um, what did you eat in your last meal? What did you eat last week? I mean, all of these are, are not easy issues. And so if you're not paying attention and you're filling your, head, filling your head with things like, you shouldn't be eating, blah, blah, blah. You're, you're, go, you're going to miss these subtle signals. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. Um, I want to read to you. I don't know if any of you have read Janine Roth. Does, any, does that? Some of you have had to because she's been around for years. And in my opinion, there are many writers um, who write about the topic of... Um, you know, breaking free from emotional eating or intuitive eating or what have you. I, I happen to like her the best, but I think her outrageous personality kind of matches mine. But um, where is this? I wanted to read you. Oh, about distracted eating, okay? People who are not mind, mindful. Um, Janine Roth writes that sometimes people keep themselves distracted because they're in conflict about whether or not they should be eating. They're in conflict about the size of their bodies. So she explains, she writes, if we are in conflict about the size of our bodies, we believe that we don't deserve to eat like normal people. We believe that we should be eating cottage cheese and carrot sticks, salad with no dressing, and chicken minus its skin. We believe we have to eat low-calorie foods if only to prove to ourselves and the world around us that we are 
we really are trying to lose weight. See, we tell ourselves, I may be fat, but at least I'm trying, and I deserve credit for that. I deserve credit for knowing that I am unattractive. I may be fat, but I am not stupid too. And that is how people think, which is just sad because they were set up to feel stupid. Another concept with intuitive eating is this idea of legalizing food. It has also been called um, a concept, the, the word has been called eat what you want, which totally flies in the face of traditional diets. I mean, they say, no, you can't, the universe of food does not apply to you because you should be eating the chicken minus the skin. Um, so eat what you want isn't, isn't an option. And so what happens is that you deal with the allure of the forbidden. You know how like you tell somebody not to have it and of course that's what they want, right? So they can't even get to the point where they're thinking, what I really want is a crispy apple because they want the things they've been told they can't have. So they put all this myth around whatever it is, candy bars or any kind of junk, potato chips, even spaghetti, you know what I mean? Anything, anything like white bread. Um, mm, I'm like a crusty Italian, no, no, I can't be trusted. Um, rather than saying, you know, okay, let me, let me figure this out. Um, everything's allowed. Now, I know I'm a little person and I probably only need, say, 1,800 calories a day, 1,600 calories a day, and if I go around eating that whole loaf of white bread and that whole big plate of spaghetti, that is gonna be too much for me. So how do I wanna work this? Do I wanna have one piece? Do I wanna have two pieces? Do I wanna have no pieces? Do I wanna have less spaghetti? Do I wanna have more spaghetti? Do I wanna have just salad and bread? Instead of using it as a problem-solving situation, they put themselves in diet prison by saying this, that, and the other isn't allowed, and they keep themselves in a situation where they're thinking about food and wanting food, and their, ba their boundaries are narrow, nobody can stay in that narrow boundaries, they cross the 30 yard line, what the hell happens, and there goes the whole thing. So like, do yourself a favor, legalize everything. And instead of thinking it's off bounds, think about what do I want in a universe where, okay, we are living in this place that has nothing to do with, with nature. Biology set us up to live with more scarcity, um, the seasonal foods, this sort of thing, never to be in this minefield of so much food. So we all have to place some boundaries around ourselves. I mean, we have responsibility to take care of ourselves, but we also have a right to define that responsibility for ourselves. We have a right to eat anything we want, but our responsibility is to figure out what is it that we want? What is it that we truly love? What is it that we don't care that much about? What is it that I might want now, but not what, you know what I mean? Like we, and then, and then when you do legalize it and give yourself permission to eat whatever it is that you want, knock yourself out. I mean, please love that thing because it's apparently that yummy. You went through the process, you decided it, and if you really love something, you give it your full attention, right? You don't, you don't try to like um, treat it badly, throw it in and pretend it didn't happen or whatever. I mean, you sit down and love it. But one thing I'm gonna say is that if you really play the hunger fullness game, the chances are that if you let yourself get hungry, you are not going to want a bunch of junk. If you're really hungry, you usually want to sit down and eat a meal of decent food, okay? Um, and if your eating habits are not such that you like and prefer, good, healthy foods, wholesome foods, um, then you really need to work on your eating habits. You know, you need to work on expanding your choices and um, visiting the supermarket and maybe 
trying to sit down and eat with people who really know how to cook instead of don't know how to cook or know how to cook yourself or something, but that needs to be worked on. Um, because you really do have to be able to get yourself out of diet prison by giving yourself the freedom to figure out what it is that you want to eat. However, none of this works if food is being used to mask pain. And that's what happens is that once you learn, for whatever reason, once you learn how to overeat and you experience the numbing effect of that food, particularly if you're a good girl and, um, or, or boy, um, but research has shown that a lot of times people who are overweight, like say if we took um, adult, a family of adult children of alcoholics and all, everybody grew up in a dysfunctional family and has different coping mechanisms. Well, it's usually like the good one who becomes the overeater because they're not the one who's going to l end up in jail or become another alcoholic. Or, do you know what I mean? Like they're so good that food, they nourish themselves with, with food, the legal aspect. And also other research has shown that people who um, are super helpful to other people, like they're always giving, 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 that kind of thing, but nobody gives back to them, they are much more likely to be overweight using food to give back to them what they, what they, they're, they're tapped out, they have nothing left, they gave it away to everybody else, they're like um, almost a martyr or a victim, you know, and they have not reclaimed that um, for themselves. So basically, if food is being used as a way to mask pain or to treat pain, and I'm talking any kind of pain, you know, it could be anything that, that um, is deep-seated. Um, all of the good suggestions in the world, like, you know, put those crackers on the top shelf where you won't see them, or um, name it, name some suggestions, that handy suggestions that are given to you in diet programs or whatever. That's not going to help because you saw when, when dieters lost their resolve, right? One of them was like feeling depressed, feeling blue or feeling anxious. Or, or even if some people keep themselves feeling bored because they're not um, wanting to take certain risks in life, you know, so they, they've made their lives very, very narrow, so then they wonder why they're bored and then they end up eating, that kind of thing. Well, if, if there are basic problems that are causing a person to eat, then it is going to be very difficult or almost impossible for them to give up their medication, which is the food, without getting rid of the underlying problem. So you really do have to look at that. And if you talk to a lot of the people around here, they say that, you know, there was a time when I finally gave it up or, or because of this, that, and the other. And um, some people have to go to counseling, you know, I mean, that, that, helps them tremendously. I mean, I've had seen people who've, they lose weight in the damnedest way. Like people think they only have to be on a diet, but really people lose weight for all kinds of ways. If, if they're ready to lose weight, say that you're a person who for a lifetime has had um, some misery and the misery is just hanging over you and you're in a, you know, it keeps you in a um, kind of like, um, non-energetic state where you're sort of eating and numbing the pain, that kind of thing. And then through whatever means, you're healed. And you say, like you've got a house full of clutter, say, and you say, whoa, I'm getting rid of all this stuff. This is not working for me. And they all of a sudden clean their house, clear their clutter, that kind of thing. So, sometimes without even dieting at all, they'll find out that they lost 20 pounds. How did that happen? I was focusing on my clutter. Well, how do I know? I just didn't feel like eating anymore. I was so energized by my new thought patterns, by clearing up my life, by throwing up out stuff. I noticed I wasn't thinking about eating. I just ate, blah, 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 blah. One thing led to another. I lost 20 pounds. They didn't have the burden of dieting. You know, I mean, there are many, many ways that you could lose weight. You can lose weight by just saying, 
I am going to sit down at every meal. I am going to just watch myself and I'm not just gonna have things thrown into my mouth. Just that's probably good for who knows how many pounds. It depends on how, how you eat. But there are many, many different ways in order to lose weight and this, this is just one. Nope. Will I ever get this right? We're almost at the end. Okay, so back to the whole self-nurturing thing. Um, even people, everybody has to know how to take care of themselves. We live in a very stressful world. I mean, people are majorly overbooked with things to do. There's sort of like almost too many options. I mean, when you think of what life might have been like, say, 70 years ago, or when there was no TV, there was, I mean, there just wasn't a lot to do. You know, people are made to live a much, much more calm life than we're driving around all crazy nowadays. And, and even if you are the most mentally well-adjusted person, you, you don't need, kind of, you, you know, you're fine. You still need to do all these self-nurturing things. I mean, just to be able to flush out the stress and anxiety that comes from living and to keep yourself in that calm, steady, yoga-type place that will allow you to feel mindful. So getting your problems fixed and self-nurturing are really two different things. You, if you get your problem fixed, but you never learn how to self-nurture yourself, it's going to go backwards. Likewise, you could have no problems and still need to self-nurture yourself. So everybody has to, has to get that as, as a given, is that stop the world, I need to do, I need to make sure that I am taking really good care of myself because the consequences are too high. I'm gonna just get, you sort of like get swept with the tide and all of a sudden your health is falling apart because you're not taking care of yourself. And so I also wanted to show you, this is also on my website. Um, I wrote a little blog called A Reading List for Yo-Yo Dieters and Emotional Eaters. And these are just some of the list. I went back to that um, intuitive eating um, group that I'm on and LinkedIn and I asked all of those practitioners to give me um, suggestions for books on the list. Um, and the, this is just, these are just a few of the many books that are on the list. And again, I'm not even going to say, like, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I can say what one I might like or ones I like best, but you, you know how a book, a book has to speak to you. Everything has to speak to you. So you might look at the books and just go to Amazon and start to read about these things or go to a bookstore. That, that little, um, I'm with the Diets and Review booth, and I don't know, in the exhibit hall, there is a fantastic bookstore that's right next to our booth. That bookstore is great. She's got a lot of books, um, and many of them are on this, this um, topic. So I think to find some books that you connect with um, and dive in and try this stuff um, is, the, is definitely the, the way to go, the way to get off of it. And the thing is that it's not... Unlike a diet, it is nothing to do with a diet. It is a way of being. And so if it makes a person too um, flustered to look at your weight while this is happening, then focus on the behaviors and, and get rid of the scale. Or even um, just get the, the weight thing on the scale and paste over it, whatever, whatever weight you want to be. Just write that down on a little piece of masking tape and put that right over there. And uh, even the same at the doctors. You know how like you go there and the first thing is they jump on the scale and then they, they're like, jump on the scale. It's like, I got my boots on, my hat on, my pocketbook. Oh, just, you know, like it's just craziness. Or you know how like you go to Weight Watcher and it's like, oh, I weighed in. Okay, I got that over with. Let's go to Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, it's like, stop weighing yourself. Okay, that's just causing the problem. Um, if you want to check in every now and then, I mean, check in once a month, write it down because you won't remember what, what your weight is. But if it's too disconcerting, do not weigh yourself. Focus instead on, on the idea. Like, I'm just going to wait until I'm hungry. And you just have to wait, you know? Like, if, if you're not hungry for a week, go with it. Just drink water. Honestly, just say that I am going to reclaim my body. I'm going to stop using my mind to give me all of these mixed diet messages and I'm just gonna see where, 
where am where am I, you know? And, and try to get back to that demand feeding, the, the baby type diet. Um, and that is, let me see, I'm trying to pay attention. We started, okay, this, I'm kind of wrapping up. Um, so anyway, questions, wait, the, I just want questions at this point. Who's, Audrey, are yeah, you, you coming I'm, around with I'm her? right here, yeah, and I just want to quickly mention to those of you who have just joined us, uh, we're going to do a quick Q&A, and then we will be doing our seminar with Dr. Michael Tischler. And, and also I want to say to you all is that I am going to be at the Diets and Review booth in the Expo, so if anybody wants to come over and, and talk. So anybody, qu questions question here? Question for Mary Hartley? Yes, here's a question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I was just talking to someone in the booth um, I, from Marist College, and we did some work with the soup kitchen, and a lot of the people there are like obese or morbidly obese, and they don't really have any choice over what they eat, and they just get fatter and more and more tense. I'm just curious what advice you would give to those people in that situation, how not to you know, gain a lot of weight when you can't control well, you know, what, what you're Well, this is what happens. So. I'm in... I'm in um, I really, I come from Rhode Island, okay, where I lived most of my life before I moved to New York City. And um, I just remember the doctors um, coming up to us saying, tell those restaurants to stop feeding the homeless people because they're all showing up in the emergency room with high blood sugar. What happens is that, like, the donut factory, at the end of the day, they'll say, we can't, we can't um, sell these donuts. They'll give them to the soup kitchen. They're, people who are homeless have so much junk food piled on them. They don't have to eat that. They, they, you know, like, I mean, really and truly, like everybody else in this society, we are fending off crummy food. And um, eat, eat the soup in the soup kitchen. Eat the good food. I mean... If they were legitimately hungry and there was nothing else there, okay, then I guess you have to eat donuts. But they are exposed to as much junky food as the rest of us, so they don't have to eat it either. They're not a human garbage pail, you know what I mean? Just because you have these, these day-old donuts doesn't mean you've got to pump, pump me full of them. What the heck? <laughs> so that's what I say to them. It sounds kind of like I'm, I'm not... Um, maybe being um, compassionate enough, but I am compassionate. You have to put your foot down. Yes? <laughs> just, just say no. Just say no. So take your crummy old stale donuts and throw them in the river. I don't know. <laughs> Another question? Any other questions from, yeah? yeah. Oh, thank you. Do you have an idea of how long it takes people who have been dieting constantly their whole life, practically, to make this switch to intuitive eating? Is it something that they can do in a six-month period, or does it take years for some people? It's all different. Um, what I have found out, though, is that you can't be halfway about it. Like, you can't... You know what I really think? I'm going to write a book about this, because I view... I don't know if any of you know, like, the, the stages of death and dying when you're like first you're bargaining and you're, you know you're you're trying to make deals and this kind of thing and you, there's no bargaining here like you can't say well I'm going to do intuitive eating but I'm still going to try to diet and lose weight like I'm going to you know the people who do the process best are the ones who jump in and do it and they do not they have to say that that look if I didn't lose and gain weight so many times over the past 10 years I would have reached my goal weight a long time ago, so why should I try to diet again to reach some weight that I think I'm going to lose within nine months when I could just be doing this right now, and it might take me three years, but at least at the end of three years, I'm not going to be way more than I weigh now because I was fooling around with diets. So how long it takes anybody to do anything totally depends upon their mindset. Some people are faster, some people are longer, and their own resistance is what figures in. The other thing is that for many people, it's not just the food that's numbing, but the weight itself forms a barrier. It protects them from the world, you know? Um, and they might need protection for some reason. You don't really know 
what somebody's life has been. And so they might not be able to shed that extra weight um, until they have changed from the inside out somewhat and practiced more ways of you know, um, being able to express themselves without the weight, that sort of thing. So, so everybody's seen as different. Great. OK, thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you, Mary Hartley. Again, the, uh, her website is askmaryrd.com. And she's a registered dietitian for dietsinreview.com. And she'll be back at her booth uh, in the exhibition hall starting now. Thank you so much.